So before we get started, let's do a quick activity. Everybody close your eyes and imagine an artist. Actually do it, guys. Okay, you got an image? Open your eyes. Now I'm willing to wager that most of you thought of one of either two images. Either the stereotypical Renaissance artist, complete with a palette in one hand and a paintbrush in the other, or maybe the 20th century artist who does crazy things and just seems like an altogether weird guy. But art is so much more than just these two extremes. Some of you may even be wondering right now why you should care about art. I remember having that same feeling, thinking that art is almost like an exclusive club, something that only those who make art or those who work with it, like museum curators, care about. But what I didn't realize then is that art is everywhere in the world around us. From the buildings that we live in, the clothes that we wear, even the electronics that we use, like iPhones, those were all made using elements of design. Think about video games, for example. Video games on the market right now have amazing graphics and design. This is an actual landscape from a video game called Mass Effect. Breathtaking, isn't it? It's easy to see how important art is when we link it to things like buildings, clothes, technology. But what about art for art's sake? When art doesn't provide any applicable benefits, should we still care about it? Of course, art gives us visual aesthetic pleasure when we see something that looks nice or something we can relate to. And while this aspect is very important, art can also challenge the way we view the world in ways that nothing else can. It often goes against established norms of our society, constantly redefining itself and the world that we live in. To show you guys what I mean, let me, let me give you guys an example using the Cubist art movement. So a couple years ago, I was so lucky to be able to spend a month in Paris studying studio art. And while I was there, our class went to the Jardin du Luxembourg, sorry for my terrible pronunciation, and there we saw um, where we found a very nice sculpture to just draw. Usually, you guys all know this, when you're trying to draw something, you would first position yourself in front of the thing you want to draw, and then you would set up your canvas and all that, and you would proceed to just draw what you saw in front of you. If you think about it though, with this technique, you only captured the object from one angle, which is the side that's facing you. All of the other angles of the sculpture are disregarded. And cubism was exactly about targeting this issue. How do you get a 3D object, like a sculpture, onto a 2D surface like a canvas? Well, what the cubist artists did and what our class did was we moved around the sculpture, drawing it from multiple perspectives. For example, an ear maybe from the back side, a nose from the side view. In taking these little separate pieces, we reassembled them onto our canvas. It was only through going through this process of drawing in the cubist style did I really become interested in cubism. It became more than just an art movement. It was a whole new way of seeing the world and representing that world into the restrictive mediums we can use. And that's why it's often said that cubism is drawing with the mind and not with the eyes. And why cubist paintings sometimes come out looking a little distorted like Pablo Picasso's A Girl with a Mandolin. Conceptually though, they offer a more realistic drawing than the traditional ways of painting. Now, Pablo Picasso was an interesting guy. When he co-founded the Cubist art movement in the 20th century, he completely revolutionized the art world. Other interesting artists like Marcel Duchamp, Ernst Kirchner, Piet Mondrian, Claude Monet, also revolutionized the art world with never before seen approaches to art. Just to show you guys how different their styles are, this is a painting by Marcel Duchamp. Here's one by Ernst Kirchner, Claude Monet, and Piet Mondrian. And as you guys can tell, they have very distinct styles. Now, if I were to tell you guys right now that there's a perspective in which all of these paintings look exactly the same, would you believe me? This might sound a little confusing right now, so let me decode it all with a little story. Over the past summer, I went to New York for a few days. And while I was there, I visited the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, and I saw a very interesting art piece by an artist named Sherry Levine. And what I saw was this, four pictures of three by four blocks of color. And I know what you guys are thinking right now. When you first see it, it doesn't seem that interesting, right? But I was curious about it, so I read the description next to the pictures, and what I read completely blew my mind. 
Because what Sherry Levine did was she, put, she took four paintings by the artists I just talked to you guys about, she scanned them onto her computer and blew them up until they were only 12 pixels large. And what came out of the exercise is this, four pictures that are nearly identical, except for their difference in color. How cool is that? It made me realize that these four artists that are generally seen as revolutionaries didn't make absolutely new things. What they did was more like a remixing of past ideas and techniques. And this got me thinking beyond just art. Isn't remixing the basis of all human developments? All those amazing unprecedented innovations like cars, the internet, nanotechnology, and even Nutella. These all didn't just come from thin air. We had to first figure out how to use sticks and stones to make weapons, among other things, and slowly build our way to where we're at now. The resources on Earth didn't change much, but what changed was how we used them. And art has the power to show us this. By trying to understand art, we not only gain an understanding of the art piece itself, but also of the world at large. And that's one of the reasons why I love art so much, because it propels me to think and not just interact with the world on a superficial level. And that's also the reason why we should pay attention to art and try to see where artists are coming from, even when things like contemporary art may seem so out there right now. Now, apart from just appreciating art, creating art is also very important. The obvious reason to do this is, of course, well, when you learn art, it fosters your creativity and imagination, and it's a great way for us to express ourselves. And while this is true, Art can also help us um, reflect on ourself and reflect on the world around us. Let me give you an example. When you're trying to make an art piece, you can be inspired by many different things. But if you want that art piece to be original, it has to come from within you. And it has to have your own personal flair to it. In order to do that, you have to understand yourself well. Because how can you add your own personal style to something when you yourself don't even know what that looks like? It's only through a process of examining the things that define you, things like your experiences, your upbringing, your personality, can you make something that speaks to you? And this awareness goes beyond that of the self. An artist named Marina Abramovich once said that an artist should look deep within themselves. The deeper they look, the more universal they become. And I think that is so true, because when you look at the most fundamental things that make us, for example, our emotions, our path of life from birth to death, these are things just experienced by one person. Everyone can relate to that. And that's why creating art is so important. Now, if you're not really into enlightenment, though, let me give you one more reason why you should care about art. In our present day society, we're constantly being bombarded by stimulus from technology. Let's face it, most of us, especially the younger generation, are addicted to the internet. You know there's a problem when you're always on your phone and the first thing you see when you wake up is your phone and so is the last thing you see before you go to bed. And on top of all of this, it's becoming increasingly easier to do things simultaneously. I could be checking my Twitter news feed here while watching a YouTube video in another tab and maybe Facebook messaging my friend in even another tab. Because of all these things, people are finding it increasingly more difficult to just have a moment of peace. If you don't know what I mean, think about what people bring with them to the bathroom. So many people bring their phones with them to the bathroom because they can't handle having that moment of not doing something that they can't even do their business in peace. And I know I'm not the only one who does it because new phones are coming out waterproof because this is such a common occurrence. <laughs> Let's just take a moment to absorb that statement, really digest that. Dropping phones in toilets is so common, they had to make a new phone for that. And in the crazy world that we live in, if any of you have ever created art, you would know that feeling of concentration and focus that overtakes you for an extended period of time. Think about how powerful an activity like art would be for our overstimulated, over multitasking lives. Through art, you can learn to be content with peace, to be content with silence, and to be able to focus on doing one thing and doing that one thing well. And for all these reasons, art has positively impacted my life, and I hope it can also positively impact yours. Thank you very much.